So today I'll be presenting our study on the production and distribution of child sexual abuse material by parental figures. Uh, my name is Michael Salter, I'm the CNTO Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of New South Wales uh, and I've worked in the area of organised abuse and child sexual exploitation for the last 15 years or so and it's been very common, particularly in interview based research, for survivors to talk about uh, their parents as the primary offender when it came to sexual exploitation. Um, by and large, this issue of the role of parents in child sexual exploitation has been overlooked in middle and high income countries. Um, it's tended to be discussed as an issue in low income and developing economies. And so we're really pleased to receive funding from the Australian Institute of Criminology um, in relation to this CSAM reduction program uh, in collaboration with the Australian Centre to Counter Child Exploitation uh, to look at the criminal record uh, over the last 10 years uh, in relation to criminal prosecutions of parents who are involved in the production or distribution of, of sexual abuse material. Uh, I'd like to recognise my, my co-researchers, um, Dr Tim Wong, Professor Jan Breckenridge uh, and Dr Noam Peleg who are all based at the University of New South Wales and represent um, you know, diverse disciplines uh, including uh, law, social work and child protection. Uh, we also included on the research team um, Detective Sergeant Sue Scott, um, who's a specialist um, Detective Sergeant with Task Force Argos, uh, one of Australia's and the world's premier child sexual exploitation investigation units. And also Dr Sharon Cooper, who's a forensic paediatrician based in the United States. Um, both Sue and Sharon um, work extensively at the front line of child sexual exploitation. So over the last couple of years, uh, we've come to recognise just what a significant problem child sexual abuse material has become. Uh, we face a situation where uh, we, are, we are looking at escalating reports of child sexual abuse material up to a 50% increase year on year for the last 20 years. Um, when I refer to child sexual abuse material for this presentation, I'm referring to sexually abusive images, including video, that is typically disseminated um, via the, the internet. Um, just in 2017 to 2018, reports of child sexual exploitation, so particularly online exploitation um, to the Australian Federal Police had increased by, by 50%. Um, and in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we are expecting um, a, a continued and, and exponential increase uh, this year um, as a result of the pandemic um, with uh, more uh, adults online consuming more adult content than they ever have before. Uh, and that's also true of child sexual abuse material, unfortunately. Uh, law enforcement and tip lines around the, around the world uh, reporting increased reports of child sexual abuse material. Now, the identification of child victims in CSAM um, is a major challenge for law enforcement uh, and also for tip lines. The majority of victims remain unknown to authorities. By some estimates, up to 85% of kids in images um, are not known to the authorities. Uh, what we do know is that over time, CSAM production has trended towards the more egregious abuse of even younger um, children, and that's been a distinct pattern that's been identified over the last 15 years. And so we're seeing CSAM get more serious, we're seeing uh, increasingly younger children in this material, and we're seeing more reports of this material. So despite 20 years of effort, um, it's pretty clear that uh, we need new strategies and new approaches to prevent CSAM offending before it occurs, uh, to in and to improve the identification of victims, and more generally to promote early intervention. So research suggests that parents remain a significant proportion um, of, um, of offenders of child sexual abuse material, both in terms of the production of that material, new material created by offenders and then its distribution. Uh, so the Canadian Centre for Child Protection a couple of years ago published a really important study um, of an online convenience sample of 150 adults who reported that they had been photographed um, when they were sexually abused as children. And of those abused by a single perpetrator, 42% identified that their biological or adoptive or stepfather um, was the offender. And of those reporting abuse by multiple perpetrators, that proportion increases. So we see over two thirds of survivors who are reporting abuse by networks or organised groups, identifying that it was a parental figure um, that was the primary offender.
and by and large the, the preponderance of family-based offenders has been supported in, in other research including another online convenience sample of 133 adults reporting image-based abuse as, as children. Uh, I've done extensive interview-based research here in Australia over the last 15 years with dozens of survivors and the majority of survivors that I've interviewed have identified that it was their parent, it was uh, one or both parents who were involved in um, image making of their sexual abuse and often of trafficking them into abuse by um, perpetrator networks. We know that uh, content analysis of CSAM, when we analyse the content of abuse images and videos, the majority of this material appears to be made in a home environment. Um, and the most highly traded CSAM series, so sequences of images made of the abuse of children, where we have identified who those children are and what the relationship is to the perpetrator, we know that the most in-demand material involves the sexual assault of prepubescent girls by their fathers. Now, it is extremely difficult to identify children who are being sexually abused within the family, and this poses a major challenge to the prevention and the detection of child sexual abuse material. So within the home environment, um, abusive parents, of course, have direct access to children and they have a, a wide range of available opportunities. And this leads to serious abuse and exploitation with a very limited likelihood um, that the offender will be detected. Parental offenders exert uh, tremendous control and have greater access to their victims than offenders who are abusing outside the family or, or offenders who are abusing online. We also know that where a child is sexually exploited by a parent, um, that sexual exploitation typically begins at a, at a younger age and it involves more serious and frequent offending of much longer duration compared to extrafamilial abuse. The shame and the mental health impacts of child sexual abuse material victimisation is a major barrier to disclosure. And certainly in my work with survivors, uh, they talk uh, about just how horrified they are that anyone would see the image of their abuse. Um, even if the person looking at that image might be a law enforcement officer or a criminal justice personnel who's involved in the prosecution of the offender, just knowing that someone's seen that image is tremendously distressing for survivors. Um, child victims often frequently refuse to describe their abuse to therapists or police, even when we have photographic evidence that that abuse has, has taken place. Um, and so we need to recognise that uh, incest is very difficult to detect for all the reasons I've explained. But once an image has been made of that child, it, it can really lock the child down. They become um, impervious to um, the attempts of law enforcement and other child protection agencies um, who are just trying to help them. Um, but for the child, the image and the adult survivor, the image is very symbolic. Now, because it's very difficult for us to identify incest, detect incest, and it's extremely difficult to prosecute incest offenders, this has resulted in a lack of information about incest offenders. Um, it's, it means that very few incest offenders actually end up in prison. Um, and as a result, they're underrepresented in forensic psychology samples and studies. Current sex offender typologies and risk assessments are focused largely on offenders outside the family who abuse multiple children, rather than offenders working within the family who focus their offences on a small group of children, normally their own, um, and they subject those children to quite intensive abuse. And so the lack of research, uh, I think the failure of forensic psychology to adjust their risk assessment and typology work to account for some of the bias in their sampling procedures means that we have a lack of evidence, we have a lack of guidance for policymakers, for practitioners and for law enforcement in a really crucial area. The home and the family is a core site of sexual exploitation of children and it has gone neglected in high income countries for a long time. So we recognised when we were setting up this study that there was a need for targeted research into the circumstances, patterns and dynamics of CSAM production that's perpetrated within the family by parental figures um, in order to inform and expand on the toolkit available to us to prevent and, and detect um, sex offending against children. There's also a need to further document the impact of parental CSAM uh, offending on victims in, in Australia. We have my work, for example, but at the moment there really is 
uh, very little attention being paid in research and in public policy more broadly to the victim voice and the survivor voice. So we were interested in what we could do with the data sets that we have at the moment in order to bring this to the fore. It's important to recognise when we look at our current online safety strategies and many of the assumptions in public policy, um, parents are being positioned as a key stakeholder in keeping kids safe online. Uh, and much of our online safety programs really hinge on educating parents and building the capacity of parents um, to protect their children from online offenders. But this study highlights that actually parents play a really key role in the online sexual exploitation of children. Uh, and there is a need for us to think more creatively and more adaptively um, to the strategies that offenders use to access children. And in this study, one of the strategies that offenders used was they created their own families in order to abuse children. So the current study aimed to identify the characteristics of parental CSAM production cases and to develop policy and practice recommendations for law enforcement, um, for child protection stakeholders and related agencies. So in terms of our methodology, we uh, developed a database of 82 cases um, in which Australian parents or parental figures were charged with child pornography offences, um, recognising that the term child pornography, while we were um, undertaking this study, was um, the legal term uh, that, uh, that was used throughout Australian uh, jurisdictions. Um, against their children, those children could be biological children, stepchildren, adopted or de facto, as reported in media or legal databases from 2009 to 2018. So we had access to two existing data sources for these cases. Um, the first is Factiva, which is a very well-known media database that archives um, newspaper content. And so we conducted a search of all Australian newspaper reports um, for terms father, mother and child pornography, which gave us 54 cases. Um, and we then used Ostley, which is a fairly well-known Australian legal database. Um, and we conducted a search for legal documentation, um, including sentencing judgments using terms such as mother, father, incest, produce child pornography, producing um, and, and, and so on, yielding 34 cases. So we then entered um, all of these cases into a database that recorded key characteristics um, around those cases. Um, so we initially began with separate databases, so one for Ostley and one for Factiva, and we then, we then basically um, compared those databases to see whether or not they're actually shared cases. So for example, some of the criminal proceedings um, recorded in Ostley were also being reported um, in, in the media. It is relevant to note that the Factiva cases actually contained um, limited documentation compared to the Ostley cases, because often we were working with just a media report of 600 words, if we were lucky, perhaps with some follow-up reporting, um, whereas a sentencing judgment tends to be a much more detailed judgment of several thousand words. Um, so this complicated our attempts to identify duplicate cases, um, but we were able to match six cases between the two data sets. Um, so that le left us with a total of 82 cases. Um, and there really was no information in Factiva that wasn't already there in, in Ostley, so we simply removed um, the, the Factiva cases. We then worked um, as a group, um, uh, largely online, but also through one-to-one -one meetings. This was before COVID, um, so that was possible. But um, you know, our collaborators, particularly Sue Scott, was uh, based in Queensland, and Sharon's based in the United States. So we tended to do our, our work online, um, integrating our findings into the existing research literature, um, and really drawing on the interdisciplinary professional expertise of the team. Um, we learned a tremendous amount from Sue and Sharon, um, and I think it really foregrounded the utility of having practitioners as part of a research team, rather than doing research with practitioners, um, having them directly able to feed their expertise um, into our analysis. And I think it, it um, added a lot of sophistication um, and increased our ability to, to read more clearly um, I guess some of the background to these complex criminal cases from the point of view of both law enforcement um, and also paediatrics. So there's a number of key limitations um, to the study. Um, the majority of child sex offences are not reported and they're not prosecuted, and that's particularly true 
of um, child sexual abuse within the family, um, which as we've already discussed is very difficult to, to detect and these children are very unlikely to disclose. So it's likely that the cases gathered in this study just represent a narrow selection of CSAM cases perpetrated by parental figures. It's also quite likely we should recognise that um, a lot of CSAM is probably recorded for personal use or for sharing amongst a small group of people. We don't know what proportion of CSAM makes its way online, but it's fairly common for survivors to report that they know their abuse was recorded, but they don't know if the abuse was, was shared. Um, and there probably is a lot of CSAM in, in private collections. So the study is based on data available to us from the media and from legal documents. It's limited to the kinds of information that can be adduced in court processes or recorded by journalists or, or judges. I think there is a, a probable overrepresentation in our study of perpetrators who are more likely to be caught. So that means they're more reckless, they're less careful, less technologically competent. There's many ways to disrupt attempts to um, track CSAM online and many offenders are quite technologically sophisticated. Perhaps that wasn't so true of our sample because they were caught. Um, it's also quite challenging in incest cases to assess and document the full extent of um, offending and the criminal record of a parental perpetrator may not accurately record the full extent um, of the harms that they've visited um, on, their, on their children. We can also take into account or just reflect on the apparent biases that were evident in the kinds of cases that were reported in the media or available in Ostley. So for example, we identified a number of cases um, where biological mothers um, were the solo offenders, the contact offended against their children, um, but it was only the media that was reporting on these cases and it's potentially because they were unusual, because they were shocking and therefore they were newsworthy. So in terms of who our perpetrators were in our study, um, the majority of cases involved one offender, um, but 22%, so just over one-fifth, involved multiple perpetrators. And it's important to recognise that a male perpetrator was the contact offender, so was directly involved in 90% of cases, and we can clearly situate familial CSAM production within the broader spectrum of gender-based violence against both women and, and girls. Most offenders were the biological parents of the victims, followed by step-parents and parents' partners. Um, when differentiated by gender, all female perpetrators were the biological mothers, mothers of the children, um, while over half of male offenders were the biological father um, and the others were step-parents and de facto. Um, and I'll go on to discuss this, but I think this is a relevant distinction in terms of thinking about the initiation of this type of offending um, and, and who is uh, initiating familial CSAM production and then where we might see mothers having um, an important and complicit but secondary role here. So the majority of cases that we studied involved a single victim, um, but one third involved more than one child uh, in, that, in that family. 84% um, involved at least one daughter of the perpetrator. So we see in familial CSAM productions, girls are really being targeted um, here, although importantly, um, the perpetrator's son is represented um, in one fifth of these cases. So we didn't have um, data available to us um, about the age um, of the victims, but we see here that these children were quite young. So 33 victims aged between under four, 25 under nine, and 32 victims um, between 10 and, and 14. So six victims were between 15 to 17. Um, but recognising that most CSAM online is of prepubescent children, there is sometimes a misapprehension that, that the focus of child sexual abuse material um, is on adolescents, for example. Um, it's not. Um, the, the majority of content online is of prepubescent children. And so we see the victim range here really reflecting that. So some key case characteristics um, where we had information about the duration of the abuse, it was relatively short in most cases. So around half of our cases, um, the recorded abuse um, lasted for less than one year. Only 10 cases involved offending of over five years duration. Um, that really does depart from the data that we have. 
uh, on incest. Um, incest tends to be, um, tends to involve abuse of quite long duration. Um, it may simply be that these are the cases that we catch early. It may also be that it's harder for us to detect um, the full extent of the offending in these cases. Um, of the 58 cases um, where we had some information um, about how um, the abuse was detected, um, we, we simply were able to record that there was a police investigation. We didn't have much information on detection, um, but disclosure was uh, noted in only 20% uh, of cases where we had information. And that's relevant uh, for us reflecting on um, the lack of disclosure um, in this victim group. Um, distribution, um, all cases included charges for CSAM production, um, but distribution or sharing was identified to have, to have occurred in just under half of cases. Um, and this may be because the material was being produced just for private use, um, but also it can be difficult to detect whether or not the material has been shared online. And we have had cases where offenders have been charged separately, so they've initially been charged for um, production um, and they've, um, they've stated that they haven't shared the material, but the material is then detected five or six years later and they are charged um, again with, with, with sharing. So unsurprisingly, um, there was multiple forms of abuse um, in these cases, um, typically sexual abuse, followed by grooming and coercion. Physical and emotional abuse was noted in a minority of cases, uh, and I think there's much more work for us to do in order to unpack the family profile um, of parental CSAM production, what's really going on in these families. We just didn't have a lot of information in this data set. And that's reflected in the fact that there was very little reference in the data set to um, the prior service involvement um, of these families. So let's look at some of the offending categories. Um, the biological father was identified to be the perpetrator or one of the perpetrators in over 50% of, of cases. Um, and some um, just involved in production, um, half, just under half, both producing and distributing. Um, a broad age range um, in two thirds of cases uh, perpetrated by the biological father and involved one victim. Um, two, uh, in one third, there was more than one victim, um, and the single victim was their daughter um, in the majority of these cases. Um, of the 15 cases where there was more than one victim, slightly under half also involved the perpetrator's son. Um, it was often, um, rather than the son being the target of the offending, the son was often brought in um, for a couple of incidents. At least that's how the abuse was recorded. Um, in 37% of cases, um, there was some reference made to a psychiatric condition or a formal diagnosis. So just to look to a case example, we have here a perpetrator. Um, he's uh, in his mid to late 30s. He has no prior conviction of sex offences. He was the biological father of the victims. Um, there was three siblings. Uh, for the daughter, the abuse started uh, when she was eight, and for the son, uh, the son was abused when he was 12 years, years old. Um, for the daughter, the abuse persisted over four and a half years, and the son was abused on one occasion. Um, so this was CSAM production um, and also sexual abuse. Uh, and in this case, uh, it was detected when the elder sibling, who according to our information was not subject to sexual abuse, um, uh, disclosed to their mother, who was a non-resident mother. Um, so the father sexually abused the daughter and the son. Um, the parents here were separated and the mother was li living at quite a distance uh, to, the f to the father and the children. Um, he had um, sole custody um, of his children. Um, only two of the three children were identified as, as abuse and the son was only abused on, on one occasion, um, but the abuse of the daughter was quite prolonged. Um, and so um, it was only the daughter where CSAM was produced. Um, this was aggravated sexual assault with force uh, and the offending ended um, when the eldest son explained to the mother that the father was showering and sleeping um, with his sister. So the mother then took the children away um, and we assume that she then made the report um, to, to the police and he was then arrested. So the biological maternal offender, so we had 28% of cases um, where the victim's biological mother was reported to have been involved. Um, none of these women um, had, um, uh, that we knew of, um, had a previous sexual offending history. Um, 
there were eight cases where the biological mother was the sole um, perpetrator, so about one third of these cases, and then in two thirds of cases she was the, the co-offender. Um, in the majority of the eight solo maternal cases, bearing in mind that these cases we predominantly received our information from media reporting, so we didn't have a lot of information about them, but it was reported that the mothers produced the material for men online or men that they knew, um, but we didn't know, we need to know more about these cases. Um, I will say that we are seeing this profile um, emerge um, internationally, not just in Australia, but in other jurisdictions um, where uh, a woman is contacted often through a dating app or online um, and she's promised some kind of romantic involvement um, by a man online um, and then sexual conversation um, then extends to the woman's ch um, children and essentially the male offender grooms the woman into abusing the child and, and, and making material uh, for him. Um, but uh, I think that you know, we really need more research in order to open up the, the dynamics of these cases. Um, the age of the perpetrator was reported in five cases, so some were quite young, but some were in their, their mid-40s. Um, none of these women had a criminal record and only one was reported to have a psychiatric, psychiatric condition or a formal diagnosis. So just a case study example, um, the, the mother in this case was 46 years old. Um, she began abusing the daughter um, in, the, in, in the girl's early teens. Um, abuse was recorded um, of one year duration. So CSAM production and sexual abuse, and it was detected through an unrelated police investigation. So no disclosure um, and no investigation into this particular um, uh, uh, sex offending here. So she pled guilty um, to indecent dealing, making an indecent recording, um, penetrating a child, uh, encouraging a child to engage in sexual behaviour and supplying child pornography. Um, it was reported that police uncovered the abuse after officers searched a man's computer um, and found a video of him um, having sex with a woman and also abusing her, her teenage daughter. Um, so this is an example here of, of a co-offending pattern um, in which the woman is abusing um, alongside uh, a man um, and recognising that in the majority of recorded cases where women are identified as um, uh, child sexual abuse uh, perpetrators, in the majority of recorded cases, they are co-offending with a male perpetrator. So this is the, the type of report that we see more broadly when women are charged with um, sex offending against kids. So there was 41, in 41% 41 of cases, um, the victim's stepfather, foster father or partner, male partner of, of the victim's mother was involved. Um, in two thirds of these cases involved a single perpetrator with a single victim. Um, in almost all of these cases, the single victim or one of the victims was a girl child. 29% um, of non-biological paternal offenders were convicted for distribution compared to um, uh, around half um, of the biological paternal offenders. Um, and of the 34 cases involving um, the non-biological um, uh, paternal uh, parent, um, six identified perpetrators had previous convictions um, for sex offences. So we have a case example here. Uh, the male is, is in his mid-50s. He, um, he has a prior history. Um, the victims were um, two teenage girls um, and the duration went for about a year and a half. He uh, produced CSAM and, um, and sexually abused the girls. We have no information here on, on detection. So sexually assaulted uh, a victim on one occasion, um, sexually assaulted the first victim on several occasions while she was traveling with him in his car, in her bedroom and in the lounge room. Um, the perpetrator photographed uh, both victims while they were naked um, and after the photographs were, were taken, um, the victims saw their photographs um, on the perpetrator's computer, so they might have quite legitimate concerns here um, about distribution, although he wasn't charged with distribution. So important to recognise that um, in over one-fifth of cases there were multiple perpetrators. Um, all perpetrators in these cases involved at least biological parent and um, five cases uh, involved both biological parent. Um, other identified perpetrators were friends or associates of parents, um, strangers, so in cases where the child was exploited in exchange for money, um, and also relatives and extended family members.
Um, so four cases involve strangers or non-relatives. The majority of these cases, um, the abuse occurred within at least the extended family or um, uh, parental acquaintances. Interestingly, and um, uh, we don't have enough data to draw kind of robust conclusions here, um, but uh, there seemed to be an overrepresentation of cases where there were multiple perpetrators, um, wh where perpetrators used alcohol or other substances such as sleeping pills um, uh, on, on child victims. And this might suggest um, that there was uh, increased premeditation and attempts to stupefy or render the child unconscious um, in these multiple perpetrator cases. This would um, accord with the broader data that we have on organised abuse involving parents. It's fairly common for victims to report, uh, in other studies, to report the use of, of drugs and sedatives. So here we have um, uh, an example of a multi-perpetrator case. Um, we have the male in his mid-40s uh, and we have the mother um, in her early 30s um, and then two other males. Um, the the, the um, paternal offender here is actually identified to have sexually abused um, one of the co-perpetrators um, when uh, the man was a minor. Um, the male and female were the biological parents of the victims um, and the other two males were related. Uh, they were the nephews uh, of, of the father. Um, and so the victim here was uh, nine when the abuse uh, began. It went for two years, um, CSAM production and sexual abuse. Um, and uh, the abuse was uh, disclosed by the mother um, once the relationship uh, ended. So four, four offenders here involved in the abuse of the girl beginning when she was nine. Um, including the biological parents and then the nephews. Uh, initially, um, solely the parents involved, um, and then within six months of the commencement of the abuse, um, one nephew was introduced, uh, and then the other nephew uh, six months later. Uh, it was reported that the abuse of the girl was planned uh, by the father. He instigated the abuse uh, and then organised the attendance of his nephews and, and, and so on. Um, and so it was the mother here um, that, that reported the abuse. So in terms of impacts on victims and non-offending um, family, um, in 41% of, of cases um, in which the effects of CSAM production um, or its distribution were commented on by the judge and recognising um, that we um, just didn't have a lot of data here based on, based on our data set, so only 41% of cases um, where there was some comment uh, made about the impact um, of the offending. Um, and by and large, um, they reflected the kinds of themes that we would expect to see um, in relation to familial sexual offending uh, against children. Um, children reportedly um, blamed themselves, they felt very guilty about the offending. Um, judges noted psychological harm to the child, um, grief and, and loss of the family unit and loss of the relationship um, with the perpetrating um, figures here. Uh, conflict and ambivalence about their relationship with the parent um, and judges and, and um, uh, commented on betrayal, fear, trauma and also concern about the longer term um, impact um, of this abuse. And so we've drawn out in the report um, a number of um, examples here. Um, I will note that I think the clinical literature um, on children that experience sexual exploitation within the family really starts to draw out a set of significant um, considerations for their mental health that weren't being commented on um, by judges in the cases where um, we had judicial comment. Um, and it may well suggest the need, I think, for more judicial education um, about uh, the impact of um, incest, particularly on kids, um, and then this form of sexual exploitation. So we're not seeing um, particular references to, to trauma, um, references to um, dissociative disorders, which is very common um, amongst this victim group. Um, we're not seeing, I think, adequate consideration um, in relation to the ongoing impact of the circulation of this material uh, on these children. Um, the fact that you know, many of the survivors that I speak to are hypervigilant about the fact that there may well be people online who are still consuming their images. And that's very, very distressing to survivors. And survivors are often very worried um, that they may encounter someone um, in their day-to-day -day life who has seen um, their abuse images. Uh, and so I think there's a need just for raising broader awareness about this particular crime category and, and what it means to, to, to children.
So in summary, CSAM production perpetrated by parental figures, this is mainly a form of abuse that's perpetrated by one individual against a single victim. Um, consistent with other research findings, this is a gendered form of abuse. Um, men are offenders in 90% of these cases um, and girls are victims in 84% of these cases. Um, and in, in this context, it's primarily the biological father, but also the step uh, father or the, or the de facto. Um, as I've previously mentioned, the victims in this study were predominantly very young, um, and that's broadly consistent with the age distribution of children that we see in abuse images and, and videos. The identified impact on victims and family members is consistent with those experienced by people um, who have experienced familial child sexual abuse. Um, but I would like to see, I think, more work in this space to really understand the full impact and, and consequences for Australian victims in particular. Um, although distribution of CSAM was not always associated um, with production, this could reflect just the evidence available to the prosecution rather than actual occurrence or, or non-occurrence. The findings of the study just suggest that CSAM offending perpetrated by parental figures um, poses significant challenges to child protection and investigation. We know that the victims of incest are the least likely group to disclose abuse, but CSAM victimisation is an additional barrier to disclosure, and that was clearly evident um, in um, the data on victim impact here. The duration of recorded abuse in this study was quite short. Um, we find that self-report um, self-report studies with familial CSAM survivors indicates abuse of much longer duration than, than this. This gap may be attributable to early detection, um, but it may also be attributable to the challenges of disclosure and the difficulties of gathering a full brief of evidence and, and prosecuting incest. Um, offenders, of course, are charged only for those offences that can be substantiated. And the difficulties of disclosure and evidence gathering are exacerbated in cases like this where children are very young, um, where children may actually be unaware that their abuse was recorded. They may not uh, know that this is an aspect of their abuse, um, but also where offenders have used alcohol and other drugs to sedate or confuse the child, which, occur which occurred in 10% of our cases. Our research poses, I think, a challenge to familiar sex offender typologies. Um, more broadly, it is recognised that incest offenders are poorly accommodated within forensic typologies and instruments that have been trained on, on samples of extrafamilial offenders. We need to recognise that in our study, familial offenders were able to sexually abuse prepubescent children while also maintaining romantic and sexual relationships with adults. This is a pattern of abuse that does not accord with long-standing forensic typologies and assumptions in which extrafamilial abusers are understood to be preferential offenders um, and incest offenders are often described as situational offenders who don't have a premeditated intention to abuse their own children, but instead the impulse to abuse might be triggered by stresses in their environment. Um, the findings of this study are not well described between, um, are not well described by broader sex offender typology research or specific CSAM offender typology research. So when we look at CSAM offender typology research, um, you know, there's not a lot of agreement um, around key terms. So categories of online and contact offending, um, understandings of what constitutes production and distribution offences, these are all inconsistently defined and operationalised in the current online offending typology research. But, but broadly, CSAM offenders are considered to be more likely to be single and disinterested in adult relationships compared to contact offenders, but that wasn't true um, of the offenders in our study. We identified three key profiles of parental CSAM offenders. So the first is the male offender who forms adult relationships and has children of his own to exploit. And given the predominance of the early initiation of abuse um, in some of these cases, we may well want to consider that the intention of the offender um, in the process of um, uh, partnering with a woman um, and in terms of pregnancy and so on, he may be doing so um, in order to abuse a child. And we can also recognise that this accords with the sorts of offender conversations that we do see on the dark web. 
um, where we do see offenders talking about um, their wish to begin a family in order to abuse the children that they produce. So the second profile was the male offender um, who forms a relationship with a woman who already has children um, to exploit her children or, to, or the male offender who seeks to obtain children by some other means. And indeed we had in our um, database, we had two surrogacy cases where men um, uh, appeared to uh, engage a surrogate in order to abuse those, those children. So just to reflect on these first two offender categories, we can understand that some biological or step and de facto fathers formed adult romantic relationships with the intention of producing or procuring children for exploitation. Um, and this is a finding that accords with victim descriptions of incest offenders as highly premeditated in the abuse of exploitation of their children. And I think there's a real need here for us to pay attention to survivor and victim reports when they talk about their reflections on their father's offending. Um, they are describing a very premeditated cohort of offenders um, who have um, you know, really constructed the family environment um, around, around their offending. And last but certainly not least, um, you know, a key um, offender profile that emerged for us was the biological mother who produces abuse material of her own children um, at the behest of men she's in a relationship with um, or at the behest of um, online boyfriends. Um, and this is an area of work I think we really need to unpack and really start to think about the vulnerability um, of this group. They clearly, in our study, were not initiating the abuse. They may well have never sexually offended against a child um, had um, a male offender not come into their life. Um, but once a male offender was present, um, we didn't have uh, evidence, for example, that she was being subject to domestic violence or abuse or coercion. That wasn't present in our data set. Um, she appeared to be complying um, with, uh, and, so, and actively complying with the, um, with the male co-offender. So further research is necessary to explore these core subgroups of intramilial sex offenders in more depth. So a range of implications for policy and practice. Um, this study really emphasises the ways in which technology is intersecting with family-based exploitation um, and also the difficulties of detecting um, the full extent of intrafamilial um, and CSAM exploitation. The findings suggest to us that all frontline law enforcement personnel would benefit from training on the ways in which technology can intersect with incest and the indicators of technology facilitated offending, including grooming behaviours. Um, how are these men grooming um, their non-offending partners um, and how are these men grooming their offending partners as well? Um, such training um, should include the sensitive and effective conduct of initial welfare interviews with children where either intrafamilial um, or online offending is suspected um, or reported. And where a father is known to have access to child sexual abuse material, um, their family should be offered referral to specialist support services, such as PartnerSpeak. Um, and some members um, of the audience may be aware of PartnerSpeak, which is a Victorian-based um, support organisation for um, people who are related to or partnered to a CSAM um, offender. Um, and so um, we see a number of referrals by police to Partners Speak in Victoria, um, but there's a significant gap in other jurisdictions around offering support to women who may be partnered to a CSAM offender. Um, and this is not only for the well-being of the non-offending partner, but also to ensure a supportive environment for her children who may later disclose other kinds of offending um, by, by the father. Sexual abuse and online safety education programs can't assume that parents are protective. We, they need to include sensitive messages to children about image making by family members and relatives um, and how a child who's being subject to sexual abuse, including online sexual abuse within the family, how does that child seek help? Um, how does that child disclose that abuse in a way that is safe and trauma-informed and child-focused, in a way that doesn't place the onus on a very young child to reach out for help and assistance? And this is a very delicate area of policymaking, but a really important one that I think we need to be more attentive to.
We can think about the ways that community education programs could target women who are repartnering and might be at risk of being groomed by offenders um, seeking to abuse their, their children. And also, what are the sorts of community messaging that we're providing to women who might be concerned about their partner's pornography use, who might be concerned um, that their partner is looking at illegal content uh, content. Uh, where should she go? Who should she speak to? What are the sorts of actions that are appropriate if she suspects or if she knows that a partner or an ex-partner might be accessing child sexual abuse material? Uh, and then there's a question here about frontline staffing, the role, for example, of organisations and agencies like 1800 Respect, which have a really crucial national role to play in our response to sexual violence. What's the sorts of supports we can provide to counsellors um, online and offline on how to support and advise women um, who may have partners who are accessing child sexual abuse material? But certainly we can't um, take our eyes away from the fact that um, you know, this study um, is simply building on 30 or 40 years now um, of clinical and mental health literature, which affirms um, the immediate and the long-term impacts um, of CSAM offending by parental, uh, 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 the long-term impacts of parental offending um, in the CSAM space. Um, we've had reports of the role of parents in sexually exploiting children really since the mid-70s, um, since um, our jurisdiction and, and overseas jurisdictions began to be aware of the existence of child pornography. Um, parents have been consistently identified as a significant uh, group um, of, of offenders. Um, and so we have very good data on just how catastrophic this abuse is for children. Um, and the need for specialist victim support. Um, although in our data set, we didn't see extensive um, uh, recognition um, of the needs of this group of children. Uh, I think in terms of um, next steps and, and um, further research, um, we can't assume that we know uh, enough about this victim group and I think it uh, should be a key focus for us going forward. So these are just our key references and of course you're welcome to uh, attend to our, our public report which contains more detail. Thank you.